Hello everyone. Welcome to today's Medicine Radiology Integrated Session. I am Dr. Rahul Rajiv, your Medicine Faculty and with me I have Dr. Khalil Sir who is our Radiology Faculty and together we will be discussing a integrated question of Medicine and Radiology. So let's get started. Okay. So the case scenario is that of a 32 year old male who was diagnosed as a case of acute promyelocytic leukemia and he was admitted in the hematology department for the induction phase of treatment. The day prior to the beginning of treatment, he complained of sudden onset breathlessness. On examination, he had cold clammy extremities with a pulse rate of 124, blood pressure of 70 mm systolic, respiratory rate of 28 per minute, Auscultation showed air entry equal bilaterally. The JVP was elevated. ECG showed sinus tachycardia. The blood pressure remained low in spite of uh, rapid fluid replacement as well as starting inotropes. After doing a quick bedside echo, the doctor on duty ordered an urgent CTPA and the finding is shown in image. Let me just show the image to you. Have a quick look. And... Uh, Yes. Any guesses already? All right. So let's see uh, the question. So the CTPA finding is shown, which among the following is the most important in the definitive management. Option A, aspirin. Option B, digoxin. Option C, RTPA, that is recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. And option D, frucimide. Okay. So, uh, sir, you know, to begin with, we'll have a discussion of the case and let's try to derive a clinical possibility from there you know we'll take it to radiology as well now coming to the question you know let's analyze the clinical setting you've got a 32 year old male okay so 32 year old male and he's having a hematologic malignancy that is aml m3 okay acute promyelocytic leukemia and uh, you know he's been planned for the induction phase of treatment but why has he come now? He is having acute onset breathlessness. Okay, acute onset breathlessness. See, acute onset breathlessness can be because of varied etiologies. Okay, ranging from a pneumothorax, an acute pulmonary edema, a pulmonary embolism, an acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma or COPD. So, varied etiologies are there. So, we will keep all this in mind, but let us uh, further dissect the question. So, in this patient, you know, he had cold, clammy extremities, a very important physical finding and a pulse rate of uh, 124. So, obviously, you know, he's having tachycardia. Okay, obviously, he's having tachycardia and uh, the blood pressure is 70 millimeter mercury systolic. Obviously, shows he is in hypotension. Okay, he is in hypotension and uh, he is tachypneic. The respiratory rate is 28 per minute. So, tachycardia and tachypnea okay tachycardia and tachypnea and just see the blood pressure which was 70 millimeter mercury this remained low in spite of rapid fluid resuscitation so probably there was an attempt to correct maybe the volume status initially then inotropes to increase the contractility so in spite of that the bp remained low and maybe with some clinical suspicion uh, echo was done and probably again with uh, some finding on the echo the ctpa was proceeded okay so till this much you know what comes to your mind see the jvp of the patient is also elevated and the ecg is showing sinus tachycardia okay ecg is showing sinus tachycardia all right so acute onset breathlessness Tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension with an elevated JVP. See, the clinical context is acute promyelocytic leukemia. So, out of the varied possibilities that we considered for acute onset breathlessness, you see this AML M3 has a peculiarity. So, I am sure you would have heard of the Virchow's triad. Yes, in your pathology lessons, you would have heard of the Virchow's triad. So, right from third year MBBS, you know, pathology Virchow's triad. So, Virchow's triad is again telling us regarding the factors that predispose to thrombosis. And uh, the 
among the malignancies, there are certain conditions that can predispose to hypercoagulability, which is one of the components of the Burchow's triad. So, the hematological malignancies commonly associated with hypercoagulability are one is a pancreatic malignancy, number two is prostate malignancy, and number three is AMLM3 or acute promyelocytic leukemia. So, if we've got a malignancy, not just any malignancy, which is a malignancy which is predisposing an individual to a thrombotic episode, so developing acute onset breathlessness, hmm, maybe it could be pulmonary embolism. But what about the other data? You know, it says tachypnea, tachycardia, hypotension, that can happen in other etiologies as well. But see, the auscultation is showing, uh, you know, normal breath sounds bilaterally. Now, that definitely rules out conditions like a pneumothorax. If it was an acute pulmonary edema, you would have got a bilateral basal crepitation. So, that is also ruled out. So, you know, it's important to think of varied clinical possibilities as well. Okay. And, you know, that again makes us again strongly suspect a pulmonary embolism. And in pulmonary embolism, we know that because of the pulmonary vasoconstriction, you can have the development of an acute core pulmonary you can have an RV dilatation and dysfunction. So, you definitely can have an elevated JVP. So, you know, this is likely to be a case of pulmonary embolism here. ECG is showing sinus tachycardia. Is that consistent with uh, pulmonary embolism? Well, uh, see, for your entrance also, I am sure you would have heard of this term that is uh, S1Q3T3. Okay, the ECG finding of S1Q3T3 where you have a prominent S wave in lead 1, okay, and a prominent Q wave in lead 3, and also a T inversion in lead 3. So, this S1, Q3, T3 pattern, this is very specific for pulmonary embolism. What did I say? Very specific. But if you ask me what is the commonest ECG finding of pulmonary embolism, it's going to be sinus tachycardia, okay. So, sinus tachycardia goes very well hand in hand with uh, the uh, diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Definitely, you know, you can just have a sinus tachycardia without the S1Q3T3 as well. So, this is likely to be a diagnosis of uh, acute pulmonary embolism, sir. But I would like to make one more comment. See, something that is mentioned in the question is, the hypotension was not responding to fluid replacement and inotropes, which... Uh, takes me to the conclusion, this is not just any pulmonary embolism, this is a massive pulmonary embolism, okay, this is a massive pulmonary embolism, okay, refractory hypotension, okay, massive pulmonary embolism, because it is important to make this diagnosis because it has important implications in treatment. So, here we have clinically a possibility of massive pulmonary embolism, okay. And we have a CTPA image also shown. Now, the role of that image is to confirm, you know, is this actually pulmonary embolism or is there something that we are missing? So, to throw light on the CTPA, Khalil sir, you know, we'd like to hear your expert opinion on the CTPA findings. Thank you so much, sir. With the clinical discussion you had with the question, the job of the radiologist become much easier. Let's look at the images that are obtained on the CT pulmonary angiography. So this is an axial contrast enhanced CT scan image taken at the level of the mediastinum showing the mediastinal vessels. So let's try to understand the vessels first. So I hope you know when you're looking at a contrast enhanced CT scan you can see the bones the cortex of the bone is white so this is CT. You can see contrast opacified vessels so this is contrast CT axial section. This is the right side this is the left side, the right lung and the left lung. And what vessel is this? What vessel is this? This is your ascending iota. This is your ascending iota. So before we identify pathologies on the images, it is important that you understand your radiological anatomy well. And this vessel on the posterior side, this is your descending iota. And what is this vessel to the right of the ascending iota? The vessel that is towards the right of the ascending iota, this is your superior vena cava. And what is this vessel to the left of the ascending iota? This is your main pulmonary artery. And you can see it nicely dividing into a right branch and a left branch. 
And if you look carefully at the contrast opacified main pulmonary artery, I hope you are able to identify this filling defect at its branching point, right? This is your saddle embolus. So this is a case of saddle embolus, a large thrombus at the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery. Now let's look at how the chest radiograph would have appeared in cases of pulmonary thromboembolism. There are two very important signs that I want you to remember when you look at chest radiograph of a patient with pulmonary thromboembolism. Look at this radiograph or frontal chest radiograph and if you compare the right hemithorax and the left hemithorax, if you look at the lung fields carefully, I hope you can identify an area of less vessels here. Compared to this vascular marking that you are seeing on the left side, there is pulmonary oligemia. This pulmonary oligemia that you are seeing, this absent bronchovascular marking, the pulmonary oligemia that you see, this is called as your Westermark sign. Westermark sign. So, what is a Westermark sign? A pulmonary oligemia. And you are seeing this peripheral wedge-shaped opacity here. And what is this peripheral wedge-shaped opacity in a case of pulmonary thromboembolism called? This is your Hampton's hump. So, this is Westermark sign and the Hampton sum that you are seeing on the radiograph in a case of pulmonary thromboembolism. And we had an echo done in this patient. So, let us look at what finding would make you suspicious of the pulmonary thromboembolism in the patient. So, when you look at this echocardiography image, you first identify the anatomy. This is the right atrium, this is the right ventricle, this is the left atrium and the left ventricle. And what do you see here? If you look at the contraction of the right ventricle, you will see that the free wall of the right ventricle is showing hypokinesia. It is not contracting that much. Only the apical segment is contracting well, but there is a free right ventricular free wall hypokinesia with apical sparing. And what has this been called? This is called as your McConnell sign. So McConnell sign on the echo is suggestive of pulmonary thromboembolism. So let's try to understand how do we manage once we have diagnosed this based on the CT pulmonary angiography image. Remember the investigation of choice for pulmonary thromboembolism is a CT pulmonary angio. Let's understand the management with sir. Okay. So thank you sir for uh, a beautiful discussion because uh, radiology as always you know is more beautiful with such colorful images and uh, I think sir has given you a good idea on the basic anatomy as well and also you know the saddle thrombus as well all right so um, i just want to make a mention of the mcconnell sign that sir mentioned see i was especially interested in the uh, rv contractility sir in this case because you remember i told you the on auscultation the air entry was equal bilaterally there were no added sound no crepitations so gives me an indication that there is no acute pulmonary edema in this patient so the la and lv should be contracting normally but the presence of an elevated JVP, you know, always makes you think, okay, there is something wrong with the right side of the heart. And see how it is correlating radiologically. You see the hypokinesia there. So the right side of the heart has actually failed there. You know, that is why I was talking of the acute core pulmonary. So uh, with a radiological diagnosis also of a saddle thrombus, you know, we have come to a diagnosis of an acute massive pulmonary embolism due to a saddle thrombus. Now, what is the question asking? You know, it's about the treatment part. As Sir said, you know, in the part of the discussion, the question asked regarding which of the following is most important in the definitive management of this patient, which means the definitive management of acute massive pulmonary embolism. So, something is quite obvious. The patient is having a hemodynamic instability. Okay, patient is in hypotension. You have got to do something here. Okay, otherwise, you know, you lose the patient. So, you have got to lyse the clot, you know, you have got to have a reperfusion strategy here. And uh, what is the reperfusion strategy? You have got to go for a thrombolysis, you have got to lyse the clot. So, in a case of an acute massive pulmonary embolism, no doubt, you know, you have got to start anticoagulation without any delay. Yes, that is a part of treatment. But along with that as definitive treatment, you know, you have got to go for thrombolysis, okay. You've got to go for thrombolysis. And sir, you know, the agent that we commonly use is uh, Altiplase. Okay, Altiplase uh, we use. And at a dose of um, 100 milligram, 
over two hours. Okay, it's a different dose for a stroke thrombolysis for pulmonary embolism. Hundred milligram over two hours is the dose that we give. So you've got to give this so that you lyse the clot because uh, anticoagulation yes important. But what is the role of anticoagulation? Anticoagulation. will prevent the further propagation of thrombus but what about the clot that is already set in there you have got to lyse it okay now i'll just show you a flow chart okay the flow chart that i'm going to show you is from the guidelines because the management of acute pulmonary embolism as i have discussed in my video lectures also so the guideline is actually the 2019 guideline of the european respiratory society and the European Society of Cardiology so i'll just show you a simplified flow chart from the guideline on a patient with a suspected pulmonary embolism with hemodynamic instability okay so hemodynamic instability remember quickly go for a bedside transthoracic echo which uh, most likely will show at rv dysfunction in case of pulmonary embolism because if it does not show it is very less likely to be a pulmonary embolism to have a patient in hypotension in a patient with pulmonary embolism you cannot have a simply a normal rv there in that condition so if you are having an rv dysfunction how do you confirm you have to go for a ctpa but if the ctpa is actually showing thrombus you know you will have to manage this as a high risk pulmonary embolism where you will definitely without delay anticoagulate and also you will give a thrombolytic therapy but the question is you know here you know we had a radiology facility for ctpa what if there is no facility for ctpa remember in a clinical setting like this in a prothrombotic state with acute pulmonary embolism you know all findings fitting and the echo is also suggestive you need not actually confirm if you don't have the facility you can treat the patient that is what the guideline says if the ctpa is not immediately available you can still treat the patient okay because you know it's very important to institute treatment and you have got to be aggressive okay and uh, the answer to this question coming back to the options see uh, aspirin well you know acute massive pulmonary embolism that's not the place for aspirin okay digoxin well you know the patient is having a decreased contractility but the actual problem is uh, a thrombus so that is what you have got to address recombinant tissue plasminogen activator yes that is going to be the answer here okay rtpa with alteplase and there is no reason why you should give a diuretic in a patient already in hypotension okay so if it was a case of pulmonary edema you know you could have thought of um, uh, you know of diuretic but not in this case okay all right so uh, the overall clinical scenario sir of a patient uh, with a prothrombotic state developing an acute onset breathlessness and you see Uh, the importance in routine practice it's not just for your exams you know in routine practice you see how medicine and radiology are linked because we will be coming up with more such beautiful integrated videos you know showing you the beauty of medicine and radiology thank you so much khalil sir also for joining you know it was a pleasure uh, having a session with thank you thank stay you. tuned uh, for more such videos thank you thank you